Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Give her one. Emily Pugh and I are going to present two projects undertaken at the Center for Advanced Study at the National Gallery, one long-term and continuing, and one very recent and completed. Both of the digital projects are rooted in the research produced for the book Keywords in American Landscape Design you see here. It's a book that traces through texts and images from the colonial period through the mid-19th century, the changing meaning of landscape and garden terminology as it was transformed into an American landscape vocabulary. In preparing the book, many uh, researchers over many years compiled from libraries, museums, and archives, descriptions of and references to gardens and design landscapes from a wide variety of sources, collecting both published and manuscript texts and a corpus of images comprising more than 1,800 items. 1,000 of these illustrations and hundreds of citations are published in the volume, which weighs 10 pounds, <laughs> which is organized by 100 key words, terms that were selected along a variety of interpretive axes. There are also essays and extensive bibliography. You see here the list of key words, and I'm going to show you just one. Oh, it's okay, it's all right. Uh, and I'll show you one key word, hermitage, uh, to illustrate the format of the book. You see hermitage here. Each of the 100 keywords is accompanied in the book by a short historical essay, a selection of images, and a chronologically arranged section of usage and citation. Now from the inception of the project, well before digital publication was within range of our small effort, the goal was to publish a book. Although we managed images with databases, the effort was toward not an online project until after the book came out in 2010. Here we are, still in a pilot phase of collecting new and improved digital images and information and developing a style sheet and formatting standards so that the material is presented in a consistent way. The methodological concerns for the project as a whole are the same, relating text and image, the evolution of a regional vocabulary of design, the transformation of features over time and place, the history of landscape representation and image making, these are all concerns that remain intact with the new project. But now we're in the position to create a relational database, making available a corpus of research material far exceeding what could be presented in a single printed volume, no matter how heavy. It should provide other means of navigating and organizing the information, as well as allow the user to focus on different aspects of the corpus, places, people, objects, and not just keywords thus offering an extensively cross-referenced compendium of social and geographical history of gardens in early America. But how to make this corpus available in a dynamic format that could help analyze and access a large body of text and image? After several attempts to build a database structure that could do everything we wanted it to, we turned to MediaWiki, an open source wiki package originally for use on Wikipedia and now used by thousands of other wikis. Emily Pugh, who is the Robert H. Smith Digital Humanities Research Associate at CASVA, has built the database. Art historian Catherine Barouche, who is a research associate, and Courtney Tompkins, a research program assistant, continue to update the image and information in the new wiki. This is the main page. Uh, and although you will now see that there are other ways of browsing, we're going to begin here and choose one word as a, an example of a point of entry, alley. You see that the wiki is good for alias terms or alternative spellings and associated terms. The page begins with a discussion, an essay that's usually from the book, except that now images, names, site names, and related terms are all called out in text for links to separate pages. This is followed by the image section with all the images related to the term, in this case, alley, whether the term is actually inscribed on it, associated with it, or we've attributed that term to that image. A quick view shows you some sense of the range of media, prints, drawings, paintings, and maps. And we're going to look at one map, which is the map of Andre Parmentier's Botanic Garden in Brooklyn from around 1828. 
And if you zoom in, you can read in the legend the term uh, alley, in letters 1 to L, you see them there. And then you can find them in the drawing. So the zoomable ability of this thing makes a huge difference because I'll tell you this is impossible to read with the naked, naked eye. Under text, the next section, we can see uh, all examples of the keyword, the keyword uh, alley in this case, in common usage, say found on drawings, in letters, in newspapers, or diaries, and then in citations. And these are from published sources, official definitions, such as found in treatises and dictionaries. Now, yeah, we can move now to the notes. And MediaWiki has a built-in function for formatting footnotes, which makes it very easy. Users can go easily between the notes and the main text, and we can then link to, and they can then link to our Zotero bibliography, an open source bibliographic management software. And the user can also add that source to their own personal Zotero library. If we go back now up to an 1840 citation, an example of the use of Alley. We're going to go to, I said that you can go through uh, links to people and places, hyperlink to their own pages, so we can link now to Mount Vernon. The book uh, Keywords had a, um, has a uh, people and places index, but this dynamic environment provides multiple organizational schema, allowing for a much more dispersed, user-guided organization of material. So the site or place name includes, as you can see here, an overview with basic identifying information, a link to Google, Google Maps, associated sites and terms, and then a corpus of images of Mount Vernon that are in the database. And we're going to look at one particular image, which is uh, an insurance map of Mount Vernon from uh, 1803, just to show you that with good quality images, you could zoom in quite well. This shows you the bowling green. It's great to have inscribed terms for our purposes and lawn. Uh, the next section then after the image database would be the references. And this is uh, a place where we can provide authoritative websites, including the Library of Congress authorities, and most the, the important primary archival and secondary resources on, on the subject of the page, in this case, Mount Vernon. Now, of course, Mount Vernon is an extremely well-documented site, but we will create pages for little-known, unknown places that we have gathered documentation for. Thus, we hope, ultimately, we'll be creating an unprecedented inventory of American gardens. Now we can go to a 1796 description by um, Benjamin Henry Latrobe of Mount Vernon, and this then uh, allows us to pursue the person hyperlink leading to his page. Uh, we can choose, in the case of the page, the, the people pages, we can choose to write short essays on people because they are unknown or obscure, or in this case, they're very well known, but the available information might not be particularly about landscapes or gardens, so we would write something pertinent to the project. Under the Latrobe page, we can go to the sites that he is uh, uh, related to, the terms that uh, he also is related to, and then uh, all his quotations are then um, shown here. All Latrobe's uh, citations within the database, and in it the keywords are called out. Then we get to uh, the uh, image database for Latrobe, and we have many, many drawings, so we've categorized them by decade. So this becomes a catalog of Latrobe's drawings and designs related to the history of gardens. Eventually, each object could have its own and will have its own page that will discuss the history in terms of its production, its provenance, and the usual art historical treatment of the object with links to the repository when, when possible. Now we'll go to one, the military school by Latrobe quickly, just to show you a detail there. The word ha-ha you see up in the corner. <laughs> now if you want to know what a ha-ha is, you can then link then to the keyword page back for ha-ha, which is there, and we begin all over again. 
So there are many advantages to using a wiki for this project. First of all, the familiarity of wiki format makes it eminently user-friendly. There's no need for training or guidelines for wiki. It makes cross-referencing keywords, people, places, objects, and citations possible. And so far, because it is off the shelf and easily customized, CASVA staff is building it without direct assistance from National Gallery IT or the web team, although their input will be essential as we bring the project online. The wiki can be updated, corrected, expanded, and does not require reaching a finished point before it can be published. The changes are thoroughly captured and cataloged so that the viewers can always see what information has been edited and when. It allows for the display of high-resolution images with legible, high-quality detail. Users may, may select specific wiki articles, bundle them, and download them for their own reference. And wikis generally can be archived and saved so that if we stopped maintaining or updating the database, it can pre be preserved and disseminated. Now we're going to move from the macro scale to the micro to the second uh, CASWA project that re revolves around a small eight by six inch album of watercolor drawings made by Lewis Miller, a Pennsylvania German itinerant carpenter who lived from the time just after the American Revolution through to the centennial. His drawings have provided us with great material for the history of American landscape design. There are about 2,000 drawings that we know of by Lewis Miller. They're held primarily in two collections, the York Heritage Center in York, PA, and the Rockefeller Folk Art Museum in Williamsburg, Virginia. And I show you just one other drawing by um, Miller from another uh, sketchbook in uh, York, or is it Williams in Williamsburg, uh, Landscapes of Virginia. This album, however, is alone in Dearborn, Michigan. It's at the Henry Ford Museum, and it was purchased in 1960s by Donald Shelley, the executive director, director there. He also is from York. He wrote the only book on Miller, and in it he claims that Miller's work was unmatched by that, that of any other American folk artist. Miller's drawings are well known among historians of American art and architecture who have used them as documentation of vernacular life and cultural landscape. But no one really has examined Miller on his own terms. The relatively unknown album in, Deer in Dearborn is a guide to Central Park in New York, the first great urban park in America. It seemed an ideal topic for the online journal 19th Century Art Worldwide because it offered a focused entry into both Miller's worldview and into the study of the most important landscape undertaking of the 19th century. The 54 leaves are filled with watercolors of the park's earliest features and structures and inscribed with English and German poems and commentary, which is um, in Miller's unusual style. The struggle we faced on the outset, from the outset, uh, and that persisted actually through the very end stage of the article, was caused by the interaction between the digital medium and content. What shape would this article take? And what would the user's experience be? Even writing a table of contents couldn't happen until we were well into the work. Initially, we had the idea to map Miller's movements through the park, and perhaps his travels in general, since we still at that point assumed he did visit all the places he depicted. Paradoxically, it became the least developed part of the article because our research began to focus more and more and we became preoccupied with Miller's sources for his images and text. The article which appeared in spring 2013 is multifaceted. Our primary goal was to make the whole object visible through a digital facsimile which is embedded in the article. The Henry Ford was very supportive of the undertaking and provided high resolution scans of the object. Emily found the open source software book reader to suit our needs with the addition of two tools to expand the analysis of the object. The first tool allowed the transcription and translation from German when necessary of all the text through the sketchbook and an overall description of each album page. 
The second tool provides space for the identification of text, images, and their subjects. And Catherine Baruch identified almost all the English and German texts that filled the sketchbook. And this was the first breakthrough in terms of our understanding of the breadth of Miller's literary appetite. William Cullen Bryant, Shakespeare, Martin Luther, Lord Byron, we were amazed it was a miscellany of poems, fiction, and travel literature, as well as botanical material. This tool displays links to all the texts quoted by Miller and associated images and databases of relevant material, including park commissioner's reports, newspaper archives, and even audio and video clips of reenactments of the music performed in Central Park in the first decade of its existence. The images, just like the text, once analyzed, compared, and decoded, reveal a wealth of pictorial sources that drew from the burgeoning illustrated press. Harper's Weekly, Frank Leslie's, Godey's, Maggie, Godey's Ladies Book. Miller was not the naive folk artist or even eyewitness we took him to be, but rather an inveterate copyist, and this album was an omnium gatherum of visual culture. There are two essays in the article, extensively illustrated and annotated, and in them we examine the evidence and argue for a new interpretation of the album, of other works by Miller, and Miller himself. My essay asks how and why did the Central Park, an elite product of New York society, attract the attention of the so-called folk artists from Pennsylvania? Also, how does the album relate to the rest of Miller's work? And I'm showing you here uh, one of the album pages on the left of the bell tower, and on the right, a plate from what I propose to be one of Miller's key models for his guidebook. It's the first photographic guidebook to Central Park by Fred Perkins and W.H. Guild, published in New York in 1864, the date that Miller put on his own sketchbook. This study has taught us a great deal about the penetration of the new pictorial press, especially in the middle decades of the 19th century, when innovations in printing and photographic technology revolutionized popular publishing. The next. This essay also argues that Miller's lifetime of drawing and writing, and here I'm showing you one of Miller's most famous drawings on the left from a he dated around 1853, and comparing it to an anti-abolitionist broadside from about 1850, which might have had some influence on him. But this reveals him not as an exponent of a closed folk tradition, but as a person partaking, partaking very much in contemporary life, where the deluge of visual and textual culture impressed and shaped his worldview. This is just the beginning of a new history of Lewis Miller. The second essay goes a long way toward writing a history of religious imagery in this period. Entitled A Pilgrim in the Park, Catherine Baruch discusses the theme of the religious traveler with, within Miller's Guide and contends that the text accompanying the drawings functions as meditations or prayers. This is one page from the album on the left and another earlier drawing from, um, um, from Miller. She extends this inquiry beyond the album to his many other drawings in which he seems to copy religious imagery obsessively throughout his life with themes well outside the Pennsylvania German Lutheran Church in which he was raised. And these are, this is another drawing by him on the left with a sword, which is a frontispiece from a, an 18th century uh, prayer book. And finally, the mapping. Jessica Roos, a contract developer for the project used ViewShare, another free web application with interactive pins to map the album views on the map, which expand to reveal Miller's drawing and then links to contemporary views. So the advantages of publishing this article in an online format are numerous. First, the digital edition can provide a complete high-resolution facsimile of the album within a scholarly article. Second, linking to myriad sources, comparanda, databases, and website brings so much more evidence to bear upon the thesis of the article than any conventional publication could provide. 
Third, this is the study of a place, Central Park. So the spatial description and analysis through mapping allows a direct connection to be made from each album view to the actual physical place, then and now, as well as to all the history of the park's design, reception, and representation. Fourth, it was possible to find sources in a relatively quick and easy way. What might have taken years was accomplished in the six weeks that took us to prepare this digital article. An online article unifies traditional scholarly interpretation with new tools that exploit rich digital resources and viewing techniques. The Dearborn album provided a key to identifying Lewis Miller's point of view beyond the role of documentarian and to see him as a witness to a dynamic period of social and cultural transformations. As a result, it becomes essential now to reconsider him historiographically, how Miller has been read within American folk art history, and how and to come to terms with complex notions of his authenticity. Thank you.